Greetings. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about um, whistleblowing and um, how it's possible to uh, use whistleblowing uh, for doing some actions that uh, have to do with, uh, let's say, social activism. Um, and what we mean by this will, will hopefully be clearer to you after the end of this presentation. Um, and um, in case some of you uh, attended also the workshop that we did uh, yesterday on the same topic uh, with uh, Fabio Pietrosanti, um, you may have some information that is uh, a bit repeated. Um, however, no, hopefully there will be something new uh, also from this presentation for you to uh, take back and, uh, and learn. Um, so to get started, I guess I shall introduce uh, what is uh, the hat that I am currently wearing, because uh, um, I, I wear multiple hats depending on uh, the kind of situation and the kind of thing that uh, I am uh, talking about. And uh, today I am wearing the uh, Hermes Center um, hat. Um, so the Hermes Center is this uh, nonprofit organization that uh, we founded uh, back in 2012. Um, and uh, it's composed mainly of uh, a set, a very diverse set of people that uh, come from the IT security background, uh, that are hackers, uh, but also lawyers and, uh, and uh, policy experts that uh, have decided to join forces and get together to uh, tackle with the, the issues of uh, digital human rights and transparency uh, from a technical and a legal perspective. And uh, we are mainly uh, based out of Italy, and we are mainly Italian, but uh, a lot of, uh, of the work that we do is uh, international. Uh, and we are also uh, looking for finding collaborations with uh, uh, other people or organizations that uh, are outside of, of Italy. Um, but to, to get to, to, the, to the topic of, uh, of this, uh, this discussion here, uh, what is whistleblowing? Um, and as, as you can see from, from this, this image here, there is uh, uh, somebody that uh, has uh, you know, a, a whistle in their hand and uh, they are getting stabbed. You may ask yourself, why? Why, why is that person getting stabbed? Well, because um, you know, whistleblowing is uh, the act of uh, speaking up in the public interest. That means uh, that a whistleblower is somebody that uh, witnesses some wrongdoing and some um, things that they consider to be wrong and decide that instead of just standing there and watching, they wish to do something about it. Uh, and what they choose to do is speak about it. Uh, and they do so uh, either by speaking to media organizations, uh, to the company that they work for, or to the authorities. Uh, this obviously has some consequences, as we will see with some examples of whistleblowing. Uh, because when you decide to blow the whistle, uh, you are probably doing some damage to somebody else. And if that somebody else is, something, is somebody very powerful, uh, as is the case of a government or a big corporation, they may decide to retaliate against you and decide to make your life a uh, quite unpleasant life. Um, and so that is why we see here the image of a person that is blowing the whistle and they are getting stabbed by you know, dozens of knives. And and so the, the topic of, of whistleblowing is, is clearly uh, very strictly uh, and tightly related to the issues of uh, uh, transparency and public disclosure. Um, so where, where by transparency we mean um, the concept of uh, uh, having every process and every information that is relevant to certain people be known to them. Uh, and public disclosure is uh, uh, the act of making things that are kept secret for a reason that is considered to be not right, um, opening them up and making them public. So uh, public disclosure does not necessarily um, mean that what is being um, leaked or made public uh, is something that represents acts of wrongdoing. It is merely the fact that that information should not be secret in the first place. And therefore, it is just to do an act of leaking and making it public. Um, and so what, what, is, what is also uh, you know, in important, I think, to, to say is that whistleblowing is not just leaking. Uh, it is not just the act of making um, previously secret information public, uh, but it is also um, you know, tackling um, issues of wrongdoing even without documents or even without um, materials. Uh, as as we will see in, uh, in 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 some some examples of uh, of whistleblowing, 
Um, so this is this is uh, by no means uh, a complete uh, history of uh, of whistleblowing or of whistleblowers, um, but it is just uh, you know some some examples that uh, I thought would be interesting to uh, just you know talk a little bit about um, to understand uh, you know how this phenomenon has has grown has evolved uh, and what are some very famous examples of whistleblowing. So the first example is. Uh, um is the case of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, you, you may recognize this uh, gentleman over here. Um, the, his name is Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, and uh, in 1970, uh, he decided to uh, blow the whistle um, by leaking some documents uh, that, ha that detailed the involvement of the United States uh, in the Vietnam War. And this was a, a huge uh, dossier of documents uh, that he initially uh, pro offered to, to the Nixon uh, um, national security advisors. And he said, look, these documents are clearly, uh, are, are, you know, are, are, are documents that should be made public. The, 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 the people have, have the right to, to know about these things uh, because you know, they, are, they are detailing some, some wrongdoing that, that is occurring during, um, you know, during this, this conflict. Uh, and uh, and they said no. We're sorry. We're not interested in this stuff. Uh, you can just go go away and uh, not bug us anymore. And so at that point he said, okay, what what shall I do? They uh, you know these people that uh, are supposed to be my government that is supposed to uh, you know protect me and uh, go in the interest of the citizens have clearly decided to not go in the interest of the citizens. Uh, therefore he decided to uh, leak these documents to the uh, New York Times. And um, and so at that point the New York Times started publishing this. Uh, know this running piece on, on these uh, these leaked documents and eventually um, his identity was uh, you know he, he decided to come forward and say look I, I because a trial started uh, and the people accused were the New York Times for having um, acquired classified information and having published it um, and so he decided to, to come up and say yes I did this uh, I did this for these reasons because I believe that it is right for the people to know these things um, and this was actually the first case um, of uh, the, uh, the, the 1917 Espionage Act being applied to a whistleblower, uh, which is uh, you know, um, an, an act that says if, uh, if somebody is, uh, is giving out information to uh, an enemy, um, then they are to be, you know, they, they, uh, they, they, need they will go through some very serious consequences. And this is the same uh, um, act that has been brought up recently in uh, the Bradley Manning case uh, um, and possibly may also be uh, in the Thomas Drake case and in uh, a variety of other uh, whistleblowing cases in, uh, in recent history. Um, the, you know, wh how this concluded in the end was, I, I guess, in quite well because uh, he was freed because there were some uh, irregularities in the trial. Uh, some, um, some information was acquired through uh, non-legal means, therefore the trial was deemed invalid and uh, uh, Daniel Ellsberg was uh, eventually uh, released. Um, another very interesting case of, uh, of whistleblowing, which uh, uh, is also documented in a, in a very uh, nice film uh, of uh, 1973 uh, uh, by Sidney Lumet with uh, Al Pacino, is, uh, is the Frank Serpico case. Um, this is uh, a case of, uh, of, um, of a whistleblower that is simply doing their job, uh, in, in, in his case, uh, uh, working as a police officer in the New York Police Department. Um, uh, and uh, they were witnessing tons and tons of, of acts of bribery and, uh, and of wrongdoing. So he decided to, at, at a certain point, after seeing that this situation was really something that was you know, unacceptable, he decided to, to blow the whistle on it. Uh, and so he went to, um, to some judges, because obviously he could not go to the police, because <laughs> they were the, 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 the people that he was blowing the whistle on. And, and um, uh, a case was opened, and uh, they, uh, a series of people were, uh, were sentenced. Uh, and, uh, and eventually, you know, the, um, you know, the situation in the New York Police Department was, was improved. Um, and eventually he received uh, a, a medal of, of value that, though he stated uh, uh, later that uh, was, was, given, was given to him uh, like, uh, was, was left on his, desk like a, like on his desk like a pack of cigarettes, like with, with like really no ceremony, no nothing, just, uh, 
And so obviously he could not return to work in the New York Police Department and eventually uh, ended up uh, leaving the country for some years and going to Switzerland uh, and then eventually retired in some uh, remote village in uh, the, the United States. Um, then another very famous case of whistleblowing is um, the so-called uh, deep throat. Uh, this is uh, the anonymous whistleblower uh, that uh, brought to light the Watergate scandal uh, that eventually led to you know, impeachment charges being raised against uh, the president and eventually uh, the resignation of Nixon in 1971. Why I think this is, um, you know, apart from the political impact of, of, of such such kind of, uh, of action. Um, <coughs> it is also very interesting because uh, this is a case of anonymous whistleblowing, where the identity of the whistleblower, uh, in this case Mark Felt, uh, was only revealed 30 years later, in 2005. For all of these years, uh, nobody knew the real identity of this whistleblower. They only knew uh, of you know, what, what, the, what the media was, was talking about and the documents that uh, they had leaked. And so, yeah, I think this is definitely one of the most uh, you know, famous or well-known cases of anonymous whistleblowing. Another very, very um, important case, much, much more recently, uh, is the Enron scandal. Um, and this, is, uh, this involves uh, uh, three women, Cynthia Cooper, Colleen Rowley, and uh, um, Sharon Watkin, that um, working in different... Uh, in you know, in different places, one of them worked for the FBI, another one uh, worked at Enron, and another one worked at w WordCom, uh, were aware of the fact that the U.S. government had received information about the 2001 um, September 11 uh, attacks and decided to not do anything and grossly underestimated the risks. And so they blew the whistle on this. And... Um, and you know it, it, it eventually came out, and uh, in 2002 they were um, nominated as People of the Year uh, for believing, really believing, that the truth is one thing that must not be moved off the books, and for stepping in to make sure that it wasn't. So you know this this is sort of the you know purest uh, sense of what a whistleblower is. Um, another much more recent case of uh, of uh, whistleblowing. Uh, are the WikiLeaks uh, published uh, diplomatic cables, uh, and um, these are. This is one of the probably biggest leaks in volume that we have uh, witnessed ever. Um, only comparable in size, probably, to the Pentagon Papers, um, and uh, and it um, ac accused of having uh, leaked such uh, such documents is uh, um, a an ex. Uh uh, U.S. Army uh, private called uh, Bradley Manning, and uh, currently there is an ongoing trial against him for uh, a variety of different reasons. And without going into much detail into that, this is uh, one of the first big cases of uh, of whistleblowing where uh, technology played a very decisive role, uh, and uh, the organization that made such uh, leaks public is uh, is not an organization. Um, is not a media organization, is not uh, an institution, but it is, uh, let's say, uh, a grassroots movement, a movement started by a bunch of uh, um, you know, nerds and, uh, and activists that decided to uh, run uh, uh, an initiative dedicating to promoting uh, transparency and uh, public disclosure. And, um, and another case, uh, much more recently, that happened just, uh, just some months ago, is, uh, is the PRISM case that... Uh, um, basically details uh, what, uh, what the U.S. government is doing to spy on every citizen of the world. Uh, and uh, this is something that you know, us uh, paranoid geeks have been talking about for years, but finally now we have uh, the, the you know, proof, documented proof, that this is actually going on. Um, and we, we now really have um, a measurable threat model. We know what the adversary looks like, and we, we, we know this thanks to uh, a, a whistleblower, in this case, Edward Snowden. Um, and we will, we, w later there is uh, a panel with uh, uh, Brigitta and uh, a bunch of other people uh, specifically on this topic, so we, we will probably uh, go more into detail on that later. But so, seeing this, I guess what 
what you shall you should have concluded is that we need more whistleblowers. And what we need is that these whistleblowers stay being whistleblowers because a whistleblower that is a few that is forced to be a fugitive or a whistleblower that is um, kept a uh, uh, prisoner inside of a jail is, is of no use to society. And to do so, or even a dead whistleblower is not useful. So to do so, we, we must make sure that they stay so. And, and to do so, we, I, I, we believe that uh, a good method is through anonymity. And, uh, and we have the technology today to be able to uh, guarantee the anonymity at least from a technical level, uh, of the person that decides to blow the whistle. And, and, and an interesting question to ask, um, especially in light of the PRISM revelations, is um, Mark Feld, the whistleblower that brought up the Watergate scandal, uh, the so-called deep throat, um, today, would it be possible for him to have remained anonymous for 30 years? Given the fact that we live in a world where surveillance is so per pervasive and, uh, and all communications are monitored and there are cameras everywhere watching us, would that still be possible? And I guess that is, that is our goal. Our goal um, by building this, this platform that we call Global Leaks is to um, hopefully answer this question and say yes, we, we can through technology. And and so, yeah, I guess in case um, yeah, it wasn't uh, very clear, w w just to, to focalize on, on a few points uh, of why whistleblowing is so important. Whistleblowing is very important, especially for fighting corruption. It has been demonstrated that whistleblowing is the only effective tool in tackling uh, a, an issue like corruption. And this is proven by a variety of different uh, research researches that have been conducted by uh, universities or organizations like Transparency International. Um, and and uh, it's, it is shown that this is the only way that, that is actually effective at, at tackling this kind of issue. And something that is very interesting about whistleblowing, especially in uh, the digital age, is that small activist organizations uh, are able to have a very big impact because um, you know the impact that can come from a leak from somebody inside of this organization that blows the whistle on something is is very big and and any one of you can start an organization like this and can start uh, promoting their whistleblowing initiative uh, and and potentially change um, the reality that surrounds them and and so have a lot of, uh, of, of people started doing after uh, the whole WikiLeaks um, era. So after, after Cablegate, a bunch of, uh, of whistleblowing sites uh, like Flowers have started blossoming everywhere. And, um, and they, they have started uh, promoting their initiative inside of uh, their various different uh, countries or, or specific areas of interest. And... Um, and so we, we, we at, at that point in time, when we saw this, this, you know, this big interest in starting a whistleblowing initiative, we decided that it was important to uh, give these people the right tools to do what they wanted to do. Because in most cases, um, a lot of these sites just limited to offering a simple upload form where you input some text, uh, you select one file, you click upload, and at that point, the, the file gets leaked to them. Uh, a lot of these did not even have SSL. That meant that uh, the confidentiality, even the confidentiality of the communication between um, the, um, the anonymous source and the website was not protected. It was done in plain text. So anybody listening, like the NSA, for example, could eavesdrop the communication. And, um, or misconfigured SSL, so that allowed an attacker to uh, potentially inhibit um, the proper functioning of, of such system. And, and even big organizations, big news organizations, uh, had these kinds of problems. For example, the Wall Street Journal's uh, website was, uh, was launched one day, uh, Safe House, uh, and the day after, 
somebody published uh, an analysis uh, detailing the kind of security issues that were present in the site, and uh, a day after <laughs> the website was shut down. So they, they basically had it online for 24 hours, <laughs> and, uh, and then they, they got uh, you know, quite uh, hardly criticized, and they had to close it. The same thing happened for Al Jazeera. So this is not limited to small uh, independent organizations. It also happens in big uh, media entities. And so th at that point, we said, we shall make some software that does this well. And so we started building GlobalLeaks. And um, GlobalLeaks has, uh, has been a project uh, that is, has been going on for, for quite some years now. It is, we are now two years since uh, the first uh, prototype of GlobalLeaks. Um, and it has gone through uh, around two or three complete rewrites of all of the code base. So, um, and I think we are currently happy to say that at least the architecture uh, and um, the overall uh, design of, uh, of, um, of the Global League software is, is, is currently quite good. It still needs a lot of improvement. It is still in, uh, in an alpha stage. So, um, you know, use it with care. However, it, it, has, it has grown a lot. It has taken a lot of time, but eventually we, we are getting there. And so GlobalLeaks is basically free software that allows anybody uh, interested in collecting anonymous leaks to do so easily. And um, some of the core principles with which GlobalLeaks is designed is uh, guaranteeing the anonymity of the whistleblower and also of the person running the initiative. So if a person decides to run a particularly high-risk whistleblowing initiative, they can do so even anonymously. And this is, this is something uh, you know, quite, quite interesting if, if you want to do a very controversial uh, leak site. And, uh, and all of this happens thanks to uh, w a technology that is called uh, Tor Hidden Services. Uh, and these, this, this allows you to um, anonymously host cost content, but also have a secure end-to-end uh, -end encrypted channel of communication. That, is, that has been studied and researched for years and is vetted by uh, lots of uh, security professionals all over the world. Um, and so this is out there, and if you are interested, you can, you can try it out even today. Um, and so how it, how it works, basically, is that a GlobalX node, as I was saying, is exposed over the Tor network. And, um, and so the person that runs this node is called a node administrator. Their responsibility is selecting that which is called a receiver list, the list of people that will be receiving the leaks. And this does not necessarily have to be the same person that is running the node. If I am um, you know, uh, a, a whistleblowing initiative uh, that just wants to deal with the campaigning, the promotion, and uh, uh, the advocacy of the leak site, but not actually have to deal with the leaks, I can do so uh, and, uh, and delegate this to some other um, qualified and uh, knowledgeable people that can be either journalists, uh, NGOs, uh, even, for example, some authorities. Uh, and, um, and so have um, just, just deal with, uh, with, with, the, with the, you know, the promotion and the running of this, uh, the system. So a whistleblower that uh, will have learned of this, uh, this leak site from I don't know, somebody in the organization of the node administrator will say, aha, I have something to blow the whistle on. I will do so through the site. Uh, and they then connect to it uh, over two, two channels. Because um, uh, a thing about Tor Hidden Services is that they uh, reside inside of the Tor Darknet. That means that uh, you usually must use uh <coughs> a special piece of software to access it called the Tor Browser Bundle. Uh, however, and, and that is the most secure way of accessing it. However, if the node administrator decides to do so, um, they may also optionally configure uh, the site to uh, accept also not anonymous submissions. Uh, and and they, they should be very aware of the fact that this could potentially put the whistleblower at risk. Uh, and when the whistleblower accesses the leak site not over Tor, therefore not anonymously, they are warned very clearly about the fact that what they are doing is very dangerous. And they are explained very clearly that uh, you know, this, this can potentially lead to the disclosure of their identity. And even though the connection is end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, 
somebody could potentially understand that they are blowing the whistle on that. And then they are, they are then asked a question to prove that they have properly understood this concept. And if they answer the question correctly, at that point they can proceed to do a submission. But this is always in, uh, in the hands of the node administrator to configure, because if you only allow anonymous submissions, you, you only allow submissions uh, from people that have installed this piece of software, you will grossly reduce the amount of submissions that you will receive. And it does not necessarily mean that uh, like the person may, may actually have taken already the right precautions to protect themselves by going, for example, to an internet cafe or something like that. Um, and so anyways, they, they blow the whistle on something. At that point, uh, notification is sent to the receiver saying, hey, there's a new submission for you to, to look at. They download it. They understand what is inside of it. Uh, and at that point, they, they produce some sort of output. This can either be uh, a news article, uh, or it can be, for example, starting a legal case against uh, the people that are involved in this uh, uh, irregular activity. And, um, and I guess I, I, I will not go into much detail into this, because it is probably much better explained by, by showing the actual software working. Um, but yeah, anyways, I guess this... Um, this is it. This is the software. It is open source. Anybody can look at the code, understand how it works, uh, play around with it, install it. Um, and um, you can learn more information by going to our website, globalleaks.org. Uh, you can come and talk to us on, uh, on IRC um, in the Global Leaks channel on uh, the OFTC network. Uh, you can send us an email. And uh, if you want to check out the code uh, or ha learn about instructions on how to set up your own Global League site, uh, you may do so at, uh, on GitHub at that address over there. Um, so do you have any questions? What is the question you would like to receive best? <laughs> <laughs> what is the question? Could you please help me set up a whistleblowing initiative? <laughs> well, the answer to that question, please? <laughs> yes, I will help you. <laughs> you, <want> you <laughs> Are you actually serious about that? What do you mean? Um, well, if everyone is just setting up um, leaks <coughs> sites at random, and there is a tremendous amount of people actually setting up leaks websites uh, all over the world, um, will that be a good thing? Will that be a bad thing? Uh, will it be intelligence agencies setting up websites? Will it be ordinary people setting up websites? Will it be activists? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess um, that's um, that that's you you ask what question I would want to have asked in this particular context, and I think that most of the people that are here present are probably the right people to one run a whistleblowing initiative. So if that question were to come from here, then probably I would be quite happy uh, to to help them do so. Um, in some other contexts, perhaps not. Um, but I think overall, if uh, there are some sound uh, ethical motivations and goals behind the whistleblowing initiatives, I think that uh, it, is, it is very good to, to have them set up and, uh, and uh, to have a lot of them, yes. Hi. Um, just one thing. Uh, like the problem with uh, like Snowden and Ellsberg was that they were faced with the dilemma of other people being uh, interrogated and under suspicion of having leaked, and thus they decided to step forward. Um, do you think it's necessary to create some sort of uh, global uh, alternative to supporting whistleblowers that step forward because they don't want others to face the music and? Uh, uh, and another thing, um, um, so I know that you have been trying to get uh, academics and uh, journalists uh, and so forth to uh, go through the leaks. Uh, how is that going uh, in comparison with the uh, software or the encryption process? And is this uh, based on the model that WikiLeaks had in their last stages? Yeah. Um, so to, to answer the, the first question, I guess it is clear that this is um, 
it is a multidimensional problem to be solved. It, it comes part from technology, but also part from policy and in building uh, better laws to protect whistleblowers. I mean, um, Daniel Ellsberg, in the end, turned out to be a national hero. Uh, eventually, in 2011, the documents that he leaked in uh, 1971 were made public uh, it by the U.S. government directly. Uh, so what, what, I, what I see there is a problem in how we treat these whistleblowers from a legal... What was that? <laughs> okay, they're coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, the the problem there is that uh, the the law in place to protect them was not there, and uh, and and from the Snowden case we can say that it is still not there. So, definitely that is something that should be tackled. Uh, however, we are we are now focusing on uh, on some some software solutions to to this problem, um, and, uh, and you know from from. From a legal perspective, that yeah, that is uh, that is definitely a very important uh, important problem to, to solve. Uh, and the the second question uh, was, uh, are we receiving uh, leaks and how are we handling them? Um, something that I perhaps did not make very clear was that uh, we are just developing a software, so we do not run uh, global leaks um, on our machines uh, and and never plan to do so. Uh, we, we just uh, provide a piece of software for uh, organizations uh, that wish to run their own leak site uh, to do so securely. And uh, we offer also assistance in setting it up, but we want no kind of liability or ni no kind of uh, um, you know, um, role in, uh, in, in dealing with, with the leaks. Uh, that said, there are there are a series of um, of, of leak sites that have uh, that have that are adopting uh, global leaks and you know ha have have been doing uh, some interesting work. Uh, for example, in uh, just just around the corner in, in Serbia, there is uh, um, a news uh, news website uh, um, news organization called Yuznevesti, uh, which means South News, uh, and they are running a, a leak site called uh, Perun that. Uh, is is accepting uh, leaks from people, and they then follow up by doing investigative journalism works, um, but specifically about uh, corruption and uh, and wrongdoing in the southern part of Serbia. Uh, then, just uh, some 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 weeks ago, s to stay in in the Balkan area, um, Atlazo, which is this other uh, independent uh, news organization, uh, launched uh, a site called uh, uh, Majar Leaks. And um, yeah, like that, there are also some uh, organizations in Italy that have started using it. Um, and yeah, we, I, I guess we, we probably should, at a certain point, uh, do a bit more to understand uh, what they are doing with the leaks and how they are handling them better. Um, but uh, but uh, ab about, about that specifically, there is a very interesting research that was done by uh, the MIT uh, Media Lab uh, that's called uh, Leaks Wiki, right? Transparency Toolkit, and the, the, the site is LeaksWiki, right? LeaksWiki.org Transparency Toolkit. Um, and uh, and it, it is basically a research into uh, the whole world of leaking, and um, but seen from, from, from the perspective of uh, the organization that actually receives them and how they have to process them. So they, they did a series of interviews also to uh, some, um, some leak sites that are using global leaks, and they asked them a series of questions to understand how they were analyzing the information, what kind of uh, fact checking they were applying to the information that they received, and uh, so and so forth. Um, so that is, that is definitely a, a place uh, to, to look for more information on this. Out of time. Okay, thank you very much.